Hey guys, how's it going? It's Andy from Agu Investing. Happy Monday. Today has been a pretty fun day on the stock market so far uh, because this was Tesla's introduction to the S&P 500. However, when a lot of the people on Wall Street Bets were expecting uh, Tesla stock to skyrocket today, it was down around 5%. Uh, and the S&P 500 opened down between 1.5% to 2%. But it does seem like it is starting to recover the longer Monday goes on. Just a reminder that Christmas is this week, so as a result, the stock market will be closed on Friday, and we're going to be having a half day on Thursday. I'm not sure what that means for the videos I'm going to be releasing this week, uh, but just keep that in mind if you're trading options uh, or if you're just watching the overall stock market. Today, I wanted to finish off my list of Bank of America's top stocks to buy from every sector going into 2021. If you missed that video on Friday, I'll link that above right now, but I talked about the first five stocks on this list, and today we're going to be finishing off that list. There are 11 stock market sectors, so we're going to be finishing off the final six today. Uh, these are four stocks that I have never talked about before, uh, and two stocks that I'm already a big fan of and I've talked about in previous videos. And just a reminder that since there are multiple stocks in this video, if you like to jump around between different stocks, maybe I'm talking about a company you don't really care about, uh, there are timestamps in the description if you want to bounce around for that. So before we get started, I do have to say that I'm not a licensed financial advisor, and this is not financial advice. Anything you hear in this video is just me giving my own opinions on the stock market, and you need to do your own research before making any investment decisions. Also, if you've been enjoying these videos, really appreciate it with a like and subscribe button, as it would help my channel out a lot. With that out of the way, let's hop right into it with the industrial sector where Bank of America picked Alaska Airlines, ticker symbol ALK. Currently, Alaska is trading for $49, and it's down 28% uh, on the year. So Alaska Airlines is the sixth largest airline in North America, and it's the fifth largest if you take out Air Canada uh, and just focus on the American companies. Now, for people that have been around on this channel for a while, I usually leave Alaska off of the list of airline stocks to buy just because when you look at the numbers for the passengers that fly in these airlines per year, Alaska is just so much smaller than the other four. It's very easy to clump the airlines of Delta, Southwest, uh, American, and United because they're all pretty similar in size. And then when you look at Alaska, it is just significantly smaller. So I usually leave it off the list, but since Bank of America put it on their list, I decided it would be a good time to talk about it. Uh, I will disclose that I do own Southwest Airlines, ticker symbol LUV, uh, but I would put Alaska as a close second. I have been a fan of Delta in the past, but I'm going to be explaining what I saw with Alaska that makes me feel very bullish on it overall. Compared to the other airlines, Alaska's cash burn of $4 million a day is much smaller than Americans at $30 million a day. Uh, if you've been around, I hate American Airlines. Delta's $13 million a day, uh, and Southwest's $10 million a day. Uh, even though you do have to take into account that Alaska is significantly smaller than the rest of them, but they are burning at a much lower rate. Alaska's revenue chart is very nice and has seen stable growth over the past decade. For me, when I look at airlines, the most important things that I like to look at for metrics uh, comes from net income and their net margin. Uh, Alaska's net income has been positive for every quarter in the 2010s and only went negative when the pandemic first hit. So that shows overall growth in addition to the revenue growth, uh, which makes me feel very good about them overall. Compare that to Delta's and you can see a long history of losing money back in the 2010s. There was a lot of problems with the last recession, but you can see that Alaska has had a very solid 2010s when some of the airlines have had a pretty tough time, even though we did just come out of the longest bull market in the history of the stock market. So uh, with net margin, which is the percentage of revenue that gets converted to net income, they've been sitting around seven to 10% for around the past decade or so. This graphic uh, shows the net margin for Alaska in blue, Southwest in orange, and Delta in green. While Delta has had higher highs, uh, they have had much lower lows. Uh, and this graphic is why I don't mind picking Alaska uh, instead of something like a Southwest. They're very similar when it comes to their net margins, and they both have a history of growth when it comes to revenue. So I'm very bullish on them because of those two factors, because net margin uh, and net income are the two things that I look at most and hold the most amount of weight when I'm determining which airline stock I want to buy for a long-term investment. Uh, one of the main positives that I've seen with Southwest and is one of the reasons why I also like Alaska has to do with the routes that they're, they're operating. Alaska focuses a lot on the West Coast, and Hawaii is expected to be a huge travel destination when things go back to normal. Uh, and from a survey that I found, 46% of respondents have a trip of 500 miles uh, as a priority for their family in the next year. So there is going to be a huge demand for air travel, I'm assuming, in the next couple years uh, when things go back to normal. And considering they have almost the most amount of flights going to Hawaii, uh, I expect that to be a very nice benefit for the company. In addition, looking at their route map, uh, they focus primarily on North America and Central America. And why I think that's a positive is some of these giants like American, United, and Delta, their money makers are from the business travel that goes primarily international. And as of right now, many of the borders are closed because of the pandemic. And so having to wait for the, the politics aspect of opening borders 
is something that's kind of out of control of these companies, whereas something like a Southwest and Alaska are mainly focused on domestic routes or some of the nearer uh, international flights that don't have as many problems with the closed borders. So their books are also very solid with 3.75 billion in cash on hand, and their long-term debt to equity ratio is 0.77, which is very low compared to the overall industry. And before the pandemic, it was at 0.3. So overall, I'm going to give Bank of America's uh, pick for industrials with Alaska a thumbs up, and I will put it as a buy rating, and I could switch it out for Southwest in my portfolio, and I'd feel pretty confident about that. The next stock for real estate is going to be the Realty Income Corporation, uh, which is ticker symbol O. Currently, O is trading for $59.50, and it's down 19% on the year. So this is an REIT company. Um, what that means is that they have to pay out, I think it's like 90% of their overall income uh, in the form of a dividend. So these REITs are some of these companies that you would buy because of the dividend. But when I look at O, I'm very impressed by just pretty much the entirety of its business. It is an REIT. And it's also called the monthly dividend company and it's very good at what it does. It's one of only three REITs that are considered dividend aristocrats, meaning that they've raised their payout for their dividend uh, every year for more than 25 years. Uh, in addition, they've actually increased their payout 109 times since 1994. And they have the highest dividend yield of the REITs that are dividend aristocrats uh, with their yield currently sitting at 4.6%. And while it might seem kind of risky to invest in real estate right now because of the problems that we've been seeing with the pandemic, and the uncertainty of a potential recession going forward, I feel very good about uh, investing in a REIT like O uh, at a point right now. One of the reasons I feel pretty confident is that their tenants are spread across a lot of different industries. When I put up the list of their most popular tenants, you can see that it's a pretty wide variety and a lot of companies that are gonna be doing pretty well no matter the, the economic times. Also, their current occupancy rate is 98.6%, which is very high. And part of the reason behind that is that they uh, focus on 10 to 20 year leases, meaning that they don't have to worry about the short term chop about the overall pandemic. And so it makes me feel very confident for a long term investment that they'll be able to survive and do very well. Looking at the history of the company, they've never had an occupancy rate below 96%. So they have a history of success and they've been investing in themselves aggressively, which has shown in the increases in properties over time. So, so basically, I think O Corp is a fantastic REIT. It has a fantastic dividend. Obviously, it is down on the year because of the expectations with the REITs with uh, decreasing income. But for the long-term investment, I think O is a fantastic buy. I think it's at a great discount. And as a result, I'm gonna give Bank of America's real estate pick uh, with Realty Income Corp, which is ticker symbol O, a big thumbs up. Next up, we're gonna be talking about utilities with Nextera Energy, ticker symbol NEE, which is currently trading for $73.60 and it's up 22% on the year. So I talked about Nextera with my green energy stocks to buy video. And if you missed that, I'll link that above right now. But before talking about it again, I am already gonna give it a thumbs up. Uh, so far, Bank of America is three for three with its stocks that they've talked about in today's video, but I did kind of swap them around because uh, I wanted to talk about my favorites first. Back in October, Nextera became the largest energy company in the US, uh, taking that title away from ExxonMobil. Uh, Nextera is a massive company with enough energy to power Greece or 10% of the homes in the US. Their renewable energy portfolio is now up to 28 gigawatts, and they've added five gigawatts in the past year, and all of their uh, projects for 2020 have not been delayed because of the pandemic, which is very surprising considering how many problems that we've seen with a lot of companies. They've also announced that they're going to be spending $1 billion on battery projects in 2021, making them the first company to spend that much on energy storage uh, in a single year. Even with that spending, their debt to equity ratio is just above one, and it's on the lower end of its historical range. So I don't have to worry about the overall spending being a hindrance to the company going forward. They've also been investing in hydrogen power uh, to further diversify their a renewable energy portfolio. This is an energy company, but does have a lot of investment in renewable energies going forward. So I see a lot of potential with the growth for renewables, uh, and they've been investing in a lot of different um, renewable energy sources, which makes me feel very good with hydro, solar. Uh, now they're doing stuff with hydrogen power. They also have a nice dividend of around 2%, and they are a dividend aristocrat, which is one of the few utility companies that have been able to survive uh, and increase their dividend payout uh, every year for the past 25 years. Overall, I love Nextera Energy, and I'm going to give it a big thumbs up uh, and a buy rating for my portfolio in the next year. Next up, I'm going to be talking about materials with Vale, uh, that is ticker symbol V-A-L-E. Currently, it's trading for $17, and it's up 28% on the year. This is primarily an iron mining company based out of Brazil. We have been seeing uh, seven-year highs for the price of iron, as we've been seeing the demand from places like China increase over time. And we've also been seeing some output uh, problems with companies like Vales that have lowered their output forecast for the next year. When you have higher demand and lower supply, you're going to have an increase in price, which is why we've been seeing uh, the price of iron hit recent highs. Looking at the five-year chart, 
There has been some solid growth, but nothing spectacular. And the all-time chart isn't too attractive. And this is gonna be one of the first stocks that I'm gonna put on my I'll never buy list. And one of the main reasons behind that is when I was doing research for this company, I thought the name was so familiar, but I couldn't really put uh, my finger on exactly where I knew it from. And doing some research, this is the company behind the environmental disaster from 2015, where one of their dams collapsed, sending millions of gallons of mining waste into the river system and killing 19 people. In addition, the company knew about the dangers of the dam beforehand and didn't do anything about it. And then in 2019, another dam collapsed, killing more than 250 people. I think this is an important thing to say that making money is important, and that's the reason why we are investing in the overall stock market. But I think having morals and understanding what companies you feel comfortable investing in is an important part about being a well-informed investor. And so I don't morally agree with a company like this. They have a horrible history of negligence that has resulted in the death of almost 275 people in the past five years. And so as a result, no matter how well they've been doing in the past, even though iron is at seven year highs for their price, I'm going to give it a big thumbs down and I'm going to be putting Vail uh, in my I'll never buy list. So that's going to be the first of its kind on that list. Next up, we're going to be going to information technology with Corvo, ticker symbol QRVO, currently it's trading for $160 and it's up 37% on the year. For those of you who don't know, also I was one of these people before uh, last week, Corvo is a semiconductor company that mainly works uh, with wireless companies. As a result, this is a company that has a lot of hype behind it when it comes to 5G. Corvo has contracts with giants like Apple and Samsung, which gives them a lot of legitimacy in this overall business. However, I did find it pretty difficult to find information on this company. Their five-year chart looks pretty solid and it does outperform the overall sector, even though it's just barely done that. They recently won a contract from the US government uh, to make a semiconductor packaging center, but overall, I'm gonna have to give this company a thumbs down. And so I don't really have anything negative to say about them overall, but one of the main problems that I have with it is that I find it really difficult to find information on the company. And when I want to buy into a company that I don't know that much about, unless I can find as much information as possible, I'm not gonna feel comfortable buying in because the reason why I've always talked about, I like buying companies that I understand how they work and I use them because if things go poorly, I'm less likely gonna be selling at a loss because I feel confident in the overall business. And for a company like Corvo that I don't know and I don't actually use their products, since I don't have as much information about them, I don't feel confident uh, if things go south really quick. So because of that, whenever I find a company that has positive outlooks, but I can't find enough commentary on uh, how the companies run or the outlook, that's gonna be a big red flag for me, especially considering that they're in an industry with giants like an Nvidia, uh, Intel, and AMD that have so much information behind them. Uh, I would rather pick uh, a company like that. So I'm gonna be giving a Corvo a thumbs down because of this lack of information, not because of anything the company has done. It's just, since it's not a very talked about stock, I don't have the confidence to uh, give this company a thumbs up. So right now it's gonna be a thumbs down for me. And then we're gonna be wrapping up the video talking about healthcare with HCA Healthcare, ticker symbol HCA. Currently it's trading for $162 and it's up 9.5% on the year. So we're gonna be wrapping up this video with a similar issue uh, with HCA. And so you kind of put together the moral problems that I had with Vail uh, and the information problems that I had with Corvo and you get HCA Healthcare. The five year chart is kind of all over the place, but it has seen a nice recovery after the market crash in March. And the all time chart is more stable uh, and is pretty attractive for a long term investment. The numbers that I could find about the company is that admissions for the hospitals were down 13% year over year, uh, and inpatient surgeries were down 16% and 7% in the past two quarters. But the red flag that I found was that there's been a history of insider selling. And usually what that means is that the insiders, whether it be the executives or people that worked on the IPO team, they don't have as much confidence about the long-term potential of the company. So they're gonna be locking in profits. Insider selling is not an uncommon thing, but the problem that I have is when I put up this graphic is that it's only been insider selling. There hasn't been any insiders buying more. And so this means that likely the, the executives of people on the team see this as a short-term uh, high because the incredible recovery that I showed from the five-year chart, which I'll throw up again right now, but what this means is that they don't see a lot of upside in the short-term and they're trying to lock in profits. And so I see that as a huge red flag. Overall, I don't morally agree with for-profit hospitals and the history of insider selling is gonna be the reason why I'm gonna give uh, HCA Healthcare a thumbs down. So let me know what you thought about this list from Bank of America. Uh, I've now talked about all 11 stock market sectors. Uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, I'm gonna be doing a similar thing, except for I'm gonna be giving my own picks for my favorite stocks from each of these sectors. So overall on this list, I gave uh, Alaska Airlines a thumbs up. I gave Realty Income Corp, ticker symbol O, a thumbs up. I gave Nextera Energy, ticker symbol NEE, a thumbs up. Then I gave Vale a thumbs down. I gave Corvo a thumbs down. 
and I give HCA Healthcare a thumbs down as well. So we have three positives, three negatives from this video, and I'm very curious to see what you guys have to say about my analysis of these six stocks. So thanks for watching. I appreciate all the support, and I'll be back tomorrow with another video.